Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, my very biased collection as usual. Today I would like to talk about a very funny type of topic, well, funny, whatever, a type of topic that appears in um, set theory, and I call it the choice zoo. We'll see what it means, the choice zoo. Uh, so usually modern set theory um, is usually going upwards. I will explain what I mean by going upwards later. And this part of, well, the story is the one that goes downwards. And it's kind of worthwhile to study. It is kind of very nice. It might not be, I mean, set theory as a field is mostly exciting um, because of its like uh, mental properties. So <laughs> if you want it really exciting because it's, it's like mental masturbation or something. So it's not really useful in some sense. Um, and obviously what I'm going to show you, maybe not obviously, but what I'm going to show you is not useful in any real way, but it's really, really cool. So please stay with me. And it's related to the axiom of choice, uh, which I will very briefly sketch today. It's actually pretty simple to state. And it's this idea of going downwards. We'll I explain that in a second. And it's really the idea of having no choice. So please no choice. Choice is bad. Choice is really bad for you. So it's really good if you don't have any choice at all. It's much better, believe me. So um, let's get started. So I start with a little bit of kind of motivational history about this axiom of choice. So I have a ZF in this talk and I have ZFC. And ZF is kind of the semelo frankel set theory, which is, if you want, is just a standard set theoretical axiom, so you want to build mathematics. And in this more classical approach, so there are certainly more modern approaches, but anyway, in this classical approach, you would build it on sets. Uh, so you would need to come up with axioms for the sets. And this kind of the standard theory is this uh, semilov frankel set theory, which is ZF in my notation. So obviously, just, just for some people, some other people, as I said, use other different uh, sets of axioms. Um, you can use categorical axioms, you can use homotopy type theory or something like that. So you can beef things up. But certainly for this video, this is kind of the foundation of mathematics, right? So I just take this as a definition of this as the foundation of mathematics. I'm not going to write down the axioms. It is a bit annoying, kind of so very obvious axioms. Um, so you have some existence axioms. You guys need to assume the existence of a set. Um, in the infinite case, you need to assume the existence of an infinite set, which essentially boils down, you need to assume that the natural numbers exist. And all of the other axioms are more type of, if you have a set and you have another set, then there's an operation like union and you get another set. Now, these are the type of axioms you see in semelo frankel set theory. There's some built-in induction and all that fun stuff, but it's, it's really kind of, kind of a natural set of axioms. And then there is this, uh, well, extension of it, which... For some other people, probably most people nowadays, if you think of foundations of mathematics, is kind of the standard, again, another one of the standard uh, set of axioms, and it's plus choice. There's an axiom of choice, we'll see that on the next slide. Um, but historically, the axiom of choice was kind of always a little bit different than the other axioms. The other axioms, I remind you of what I said before, is that essentially, well, you have a set, you have another set, and you can take the union and you get another set. Essentially, that's what those axioms are. And the axiom of choice turned out to be a bit weirdish, at least for some people, for some, it was completely obvious. And there was a little bit of a discussion. Um, I have some um, a really nice, um, quotes here that I stole from an extremely great book, which is linked in the description, which is essentially only about the axiom of choice. And so there's a book just on the axiom of choice. Actually, there are many books just on the axiom of choice, which should tell you how uh, important this actually is. In case you wonder, you probably don't care, but in case you wonder, I'm pretty much agnostic uh, towards the axiom of choice. So I go with Niels Bohr. It doesn't really matter uh, in some sense. Anyway, for this video, it actually does matter a lot that there's a difference between two set theories, that the one without choice and the one with choice. And kind of we want to build mathematics on it. And kind of the standard one that's probably most accepted nowadays in terms of set theory is this one here, the one with the C. And the one without the C was kind of discussed at the very beginning because um, there were some, as you can see, some discussions around the, the axiom of choice. Anyway, so here's the axiom, and it's kind of 
a very, very silly axiom in some sense. It sounds like absolutely believable, but the reason why it sounds absolutely believable is a little bit like that our brain doesn't kind of, or at least my brain, uh, can't really think of sets that are really large, where the statement seems to be a little bit strange. Um, so I like to think of this as being like, uh, so the observable universe might not be the whole universe, but it's all we ever care about, all we ever can care about. So in some sense, it doesn't really matter what's outside here, and we only need to focus on the middle part. So that's kind of the motivation for what I'm going to explain next. So keep the observable universe in mind. Anyway, so this axiom of choice just reads as follows. The Cartesian product of non-empty sets is non-empty, okay? And an element of, of such a Cartesian product would be a choice function. Um, but anyway, for today, th that's where the name comes from. But for today, the only thing we need to know is kind of the this definition, well, sorry, axiom that the Cartesian product of non-empty sets is non-empty. Right? So kind of for two sets, so S cross S prime or whatever, um, you certainly can find something like an S and an S prime in the Cartesian product, but I'm thinking about much bigger Cartesian products, like they're indexed by some other set, uh, something like this, I and I, and then you have some XIs, so quite have a lot of sets. And the axiom says that this is not empty. And that set of kind of sounds really believable, and that's why people um, just put accept it as an axiom. The reason why most people, or most people, certainly not most people, most people never heard about this axiom, I guess. That doesn't matter. Um, remember, just remember Niels Bohr. It doesn't really matter whether you know about it. Um, anyway, <laughs> so let's come back to it. So the kind of the problem here is, um, so why a lot of people didn't really like it is that X, the X's and the I can be just unbelievably big sets. Um, so I already have a problem to really imagine the real numbers. I guess the geometric picture as a line helps, but as a set, no, not as a geometric object, as a set, this is actually really scary. It's a really large thing. And this is a really small set compared to what set theory people usually think about. So it's kind of a really strange um, kind of kind of axiom to think about sets that, that are so big that you can't even uh, think about picking out elements of them because they're just too big, so too, too big for your brain to imagine. So that's kind of the problem. So most sets are just way too big. And most of mathematics doesn't really care. So, and most of real world doesn't really care either. That's exactly my picture of the observable universe. Because most sets are just too big to do anything with them. Uh, like most numbers are just too crazy. You can never think about them. They're kind of, by definition of their, of, of their properties, if you want, we can't think about them. And you still have this axiom that runs over everything. And people, came up with this idea that that might not be philosophically the right thing to do. So we want to describe mathematics with set theory. That's kind of the point. And maybe it's just enough to force this axiom here for um, things that are kind of small enough such that we believe that it's true. So the idea is to weaken the axiom of choice and to see whether we can still describe enough interesting mathematics. Um, and here, for, for example, are, so the point is like, like all is, is really large. So it runs over all sets and it's, it's really large. So here are some versions to, um, so here's the axiom of choice written in mass, right? Really exactly what I had on the previous slide. Maybe a bit easier to read because of my crappy handwriting, but very beautiful LaTeX. <laughs> anyway, um, so the axiom of choice, and you can vary that. For example, you can do CCR, so that's what the axiom is now called. The, the, the second C is choice, uh, like in all of them, the second C is always choice, and the first C is always countable. And we'll see in a second what that means. Um, so you have four variations. So the second is always choice, the first is always countable, and countable here means that my indexing set uh, is only the natural numbers where clearly, I think in this case, it's kind of way more believable if you just take a product of the natural numbers that you should be able to pick one element from each non-empty set. So it kind of makes the I set much smaller in all of them. And the second entry takes you, uh, the it defines the restriction on the set X. So here R would mean uh, I only take subsets of R uh, and so on. Um, and there are se several one of them. So here I would only take finite sets and all that fun stuff. Anyway, so you can vary that axiom 
Um, so here, as my example, as I just said, by restricting the eye and the type of the axis to just make it more believable for your brain. It's somehow absolutely expected that um, the kind of set theory you get by just, well, let's say, just uh, using this axiom will be less strong than the one using the full axiom of choice. And kind of the tree you get is exactly the zoo um, I, was, I was talking about. And yeah, so let's have a look at a really beautiful picture that I stole from the, from the book linked in the description, an absolutely amazing um, picture. So here is, in some sense, the axiom of choice or the Tamela Frankel plus the axiom of choice. And here is the Tamela Frankel set theory. And I'm going downwards. That's exactly my point now. While most of set theory usually enriches the setup, it goes upwards. But this part of set theory goes downwards. And there are many, many, there's a little, just little zoo here, many, many weakenings of the axiom of choice. Uh, here's the one we have seen, for example, um, before. And I will zoom in in a little part in a second. And they always all give you strictly different set theories. So you can kind of prove that with some exceptions here, those are question marks. Uh, some exceptions as far as I've seen. And that's really cool, actually. So you can vary the axiom of choice to make it somehow more believable for the brain, if you want. And you get different set theories, but essentially all of them should still be good enough um, to prove, kind of to, to build all of reasonable mathematics. I should have mentioned that the finite axiom of choice, so where everything is finite, so where i and the xi are all finite, is already automatically here. So you can prove that from the other axioms. And it's only really about kind of infinite things. Infinity is always a bit tricky. So infinite things um, go beyond Tamela Frankel, if you want, and everything finite stays here. So here, for example, a little bit before, a little bit above the all finite is CCN. And CCN was this statement, where all of these are just n element sets. So you take the product, a countable product of n element sets. And this is non-empty. And this is just a little bit stronger. It has, so it has a little bit better axioms, if you want, or stronger axioms. I shouldn't say better. Better is uh, the wrong word. I should have said stronger. A little bit stronger than uh, this one itself. And the finite one is even uh, potentially a little bit stronger. So finite would just say, so yes, finite again, uh, to just have finite sets instead of n element sets. So it's not quite clear whether this is actually stronger or not. And then you have all the other variations. So let's zoom in into a little part where we can just write down all various versions of um, the axiom of choice. So let me just say here, for example, uh, the prime ideal theorem or the ultra filter theorem, the equivalent, and they're a little bit weaker than the axiom of choice. So the prime ideal theorem, if you've seen that, kind of follows from Sohn's lemma, which is equivalent to the axiom of choice, but the prime ideal theorem itself, so essentially the existence of prime ideals is not equivalent to the axiom of choice. And it gives you a, slight, a slightly weaker uh, set theory. I won't explain all the other symbols here. You can have a look at the book, but rather zoom into uh, one of them. So here we have now a little subtree um, and I hope all of them will make sense. So CC is just countable choice. We have seen that countable choice with real numbers. So with, with just subsets of the real numbers. Um, he has countable choice with uh, only two element subsets. That's just a little bit stronger than Samuel of Frankel itself. So it's a product, the infinite product, so it's but a countable product over so natural numbers over two element subsets into like AB. And you, the product is not empty. That would be this one. And then you can play around a little bit. So the, the cut, the cut is a countable union theorem, kind of a fun thing. So countable human, unions of countable sets are countable. And you can again restrict to subsets of R, two element subsets or something like that. So here, for example, the countable choice itself is a bit stronger than the countable union theorem. Yeah? And the countable union theorem, so countable union of at most countable sets is, and I find this a bit surprising, is at most countable, is a bit stronger than the countable union theorem for only subsets of R which is a bit stronger than the statement that R is a countable union of countable sets, which you can't prove in Samuel Frankel itself. So in Samuel Frankel, you kind of can prove that it's uncountable, but because you don't have this, um, the, well, the countable union theorem, which you can't prove in 
uh, Tamela Frankel, you are not sure whether this is actually true. And with this beautiful subtree here with only one uh, question mark left open last time I checked. So I write here 2023, but I think I checked uh, quite a while back. So it might actually already be proven. Anyway, last time I checked, this was still a question mark. So and you can refine different parts um, of the true of the zoo here as well. And this is just kind of explained in this book, which is highly recommended and linked in the description. Anyway, so what I really like about this is if you have seen kind of modern sex theory, then you certainly have seen Samuel Frankel. If you have not seen it, well, it doesn't really matter. But anyway, so the modern set theory, the, the modern research part of modern set theory, usually goes upwards. It builds upwards. So what kind of axioms do you need um, to have the a continuum hypothesis, for example. Maybe you have an axiom that sounds more natural and implies it, something like that. So you build upon the tree. Um, this part of that theory goes the other way around, which I think is pretty cool. And we definitely want to do that. Uh, and you get really funny statements, like really kind of a little bit mind blowing that in Tamilo Frankel itself, you can't prove that uh, R, the real numbers, is not a countable union of countable sets. You simply can't prove that. And it was on my last slide. Now, I think that's pretty beautiful. It's a pretty beautiful field of mathematics where kind of playing with the axioms and realizing everything uh, as a real set theory is kind of the, uh, the main kind of the, the proofs in the pudding. So the main part of the game here. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.